Thanks for being patient with me uh, as you've waited for me to finally get out my review for Midnight Tides. The honest truth is just that the last few weeks I've been tremendously stressed and the thought of sitting down to record a discussion for a book that quite frankly is far smarter than I am has been daunting. But I'm ready to talk to you about Midnight Tides. So in the very beginning we had our standard Okay, we're in a whole new continent, a whole new group of people. I know Troll, I've got one friend, but most everybody here, I don't know. And I don't know the location, I don't know. It, so we're doing the Malazan thing. We're starting over in book five. But I don't know, there's something about this book that just felt different from the rest. It was so focused and tightly paced and just so cohesive. Uh, from the beginning that even though I had that standard Malazan disoriented kind of beginning, I also was invested in it far more quickly than I normally am with these books. Um, just getting the getting that clear uh, conflict from both sides so quickly beginning to get fleshed out uh, having the 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 humor and the tragedy so well balanced and and come together um, I don't know there was just something really really unique about this book that spoke to me like none of the other books have and they've all I mean I love I have loved every book in the series. The last book was my least favorite, but they've all been excellent. But there was something about this one that from the beginning, despite that standard disorienting Malazan start, and even more so, I guess, because I've gotten into a pattern with the first four books and then this one breaks the pattern, but there was something that just felt different about the way this one was written. It just felt so focused. And, and intentional and drew me in so much faster. Really, this book was just kind of the perfect uh, amalgamation of characterization, themes, epic moments, tragedy, surprises, just around every corner. I feel like it just did it all. And the comparison between the Lethary and the Tistador coupled with the brothers was just, it just, Again, it just felt so intentional and focused. There was just something different about this book. I think there was a lot that spoke to me about the Lethary side, a lot of the uh, conversations that Erickson brought to the forefront about class warfare, about um, people's value being in, or rather people's worth being in what they can monetarily bring. It's just so devoid of compassion and of camaraderie, of wanting to help someone without getting something back. And the perspective of Hall, 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 sorry, pronunciation is going to be bad. The, the perspective of Hall, who his whole job was to get close to the outskirts uh, cultures of the Lethary and realizes that his job in this whole thing has been to colonize and take over these outskirt cultures. And when he realizes that turning on the Lethary and becoming the sword of the Tistador, I just I really, really loved his perspective. And then you have Bryce, who is working for the Lethary, working he's the 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 champion for the champion of the king. And I love their different perspectives, their different uh, ways of revealing more about this situation. I especially loved the scene when Bryce was underwater, when he was under the sea. And he realized that all of these glyphs that he was seeing were uh, were the forgotten gods. So Mail creates a sanctuary for them so they won't be forgotten. And Bryce says that he'll uh, that he'll take on their names so that they can't be enslaved. I loved that scene so much. I think that Erickson creates this vivid, vivid imagery in scenes like that where I'm right there with him. And then with all this we have to Hull who's trying to take down the Lethary economy and also questioning if he's doing the right thing because who really would be the better leader here? I just really, really enjoyed this whole uh, perspective, learning more about uh, this, th the very complicated situations that these brothers are trying to navigate and being able to have this, uh, this culture revealed, having the different layers of it revealed through the different brothers. I just thought it was done so well. Plus you, you had the dynamic of Tahal and Bug through this entire book, which is arguably one of the best parts of the book. 
I love their dynamic, how to hold just kind of barks <laughs> orders at him, but they have such a close friendship and Bugs uh, responses to him and his, his willingness to do whatever is needed, but at the same time, like, you can tell that there's something going on with Bug throughout the entire book, through his interactions with Kettle and through some of the things that he says. It's like, what? And I didn't, I didn't guess it. I didn't guess that he was male, uh, male, uh, this whole time until it was right there in my face. But I knew there was something going on with Bug, and I love that he has this very close, genuine bond with Tahol and this very close relationship with him. And, uh, and, and the whole time it turns out that he was a god. So you have this sort of like this gods among us kind of trope where gods are typically um, more distanced and almost like they just don't care about humans so much, don't care about the mortal because they're fleeting, because they're small, because they're inconsequential. And then you have Bug who's playing servant for one, but doesn't actually it's like he likes this role. It's like he, even after everything's been revealed and Tahal realizes who he is and Bug is still just like, yes, master. Like he's still, he's still in that same role because his relationship with Tahal is so genuine. And I'm getting ahead of myself now, but in the end, when Bug is, when Bug is in danger and Tahal just loses all inhibitions to go after his friend, to go save his friend. I just love that dynamic between them that on the surface looks like, you know, a guy and and the person who's serving him, but in reality it's a god <laughs> who's happy to submit himself in this role, but their relationship is so much deeper than it looks on the surface and it's so much, there's, there's so much caring between the two, but it's also hilarious. Their dynamic is so so funny to me. I was laughing constantly with these two. Now let's talk about the Sengar brothers. So, <laughs> so we have this sword goose chase almost that we go on with them. They're all working together. They clearly care about each other. I mean, they're not perfect. <laughs> they don't have a perfect dynamic, but they clearly care about each other. And I was so invested in this, in this side of the story as well, specifically, especially when they do get the sword and when Rengar, Rengar? Rulad. Why did I say Rengar? When Rulad gets the sword and dies and is resurrected. Now, this is one of my favorite things. So lately I've really been um, rethinking the way I view tropes. There are certain tropes that I notoriously hate and Resurrection is one of them. And Erickson is one of the authors that I've been reading lately who has really challenged my perspective on the way I view tropes as a whole. Because, and I talked about this in my Unpopular Opinions video that I did like several months ago, but just talking about how I'm rethinking um, me just not liking a trope, whereas what I really don't like is lazy usage of a trope where, uh, and there are certain tropes that I, almost always hate, <laughs> but it's because it's just used the same way over and over and over again, and it sometimes it just feels like, yeah, let's put that in there because cheap conflict, or yeah, let's put it, that in there because in the case of resurrection, cheap emotions. Emotions that I can pull from the reader and take back and not have to mean, not have to actually I don't actually have to do the thing, I'll just steal some emotions from you for a page or two. And with Erickson, I don't feel that way. Erickson is one of the authors that's really challenged my vehement hatred for the resurrection trope because his resurrection comes with such real and dire and horrifying consequences that it's like, if resurrection were real, if this were a possibility in our world, if this were something that your average man could go through, this is what it would look like. It would be horrifying. It would be Stephen King stuff. It would be Pet Cemetery. It would be this. It would be, sorry, I'm reading King book right now, so it's on my mind. It would be this. A lot of stories just brush off resurrection, like you died, you're back, now we move. And in this book, it's horrifying. It's traumatizing. It's terrifying and it changes you. And obviously we've had this in other books too, but this is just such a great example of what's been challenging my perspective on the use of just saying, I don't like resurrections, but instead it's like, I don't like lazy use of resurrection. I don't like cheap use of resurrection, but this 
is actually saying something. I liked so much around Rulad's perspective because Rulad's one of those characters that you can't really, or I can't really say, oh, he sucks. But I also can't say he doesn't because <laughs> he does. But like, he's a kid. You know, he's young, he's naive, he's inexperienced, he's trying to prove himself, and he fails. I mean, there's uh, there's so many dynamics that I want to talk about around Rulad. There's how he treats his wife versus how tortured and confused and overwhelmed he is. There's the fact that his wife is like, <laughs> brother, I'll have your wife. Like he took, he took Fear's girl. And there's also so much to discuss around that. Like what choice did Fear have in this situation? What choice did she have in this situation? And it all, like, there, there's just, there's so many layers that Erickson didn't even have the time to explore in this dynamic, and it seems like every decision that Rulad made, I both sympathized with the horrible position that he's been put in and the agency that's been stolen from him, but I also see how you're just failing around every corner, pal. <laughs> One scene that was really impactful for me was when they were trying to get the gift for the Warlock King and they were in that storm. The whole thing with Troll freezing and feeling like he was losing his mind. I could, like, the, the ice on his eyelashes and the, the imagery of him just being, feeling frozen and feeling despair and feeling lost and alone, being afraid that he was gonna die or that everybody he loved was gonna die. He couldn't even tell if he was still alive or if he was dreaming. The whole, the whole sequence was one of the best written scenes in the book, I think. I just, I was there. I was in that despair with him. And I think that he's also just a really inspiring, Troll is a really inspiring character because he had so much faith in his brother, you know, that he could be released from this horrible situation and this cycle that he's in and that he could have a future apart from this. This influence that he's been under and he felt like he could save him from the crippled god. Which by the way, that's another rabbit hole I could go down because I, I don't know how to view the crippled god either. I feel like so much of how I've viewed him up to this point has been challenged in this book and that's another, like, what am I supposed, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to categorize some of these characters and that's some of the brilliance of Erickson's writing is that most of his characters, especially his main characters, which he has many, really can't be categorized. They don't belong in any sort of box. They're just a lot more fleshed out and nuanced and human feeling than a lot of fictional characters get. But I almost feel bad for the crippled god and I don't really know how I feel about that. I want to also briefly talk about Shirk and Ket Lady Shirk and Kettle. So Shirk, who I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, um, she would she's amazing <laughs> from her introduction from her very beginning just being this undead lady who is i love her dialogue but i also love the conversations that she has where um there is like this whole dialogue about uh, how do i have really sharp razor teeth or how do i how do i have this type of body without smelling like rotting flesh and just her very clinical way of seeing certain things is so fun to me but then you also have Kettle, who is this, I assume, adorable undead child, <laughs> who is so creepy and has the best dynamic with Bug. Uh, but she's so creepy and so uncomfortable, and everything she says is like, let's unpack that a little bit. What was that? Explain that to me, please. I mean, her feeding the dead bodies to the tower to keep it alive, and like these mysterious things that she would say about uh, if they get out, then, oh, what was that line? If it dies, then everything will get out. You wanna explain that a little bit more? Like everything she would say, that was my reaction is, hold on, let's dwell there for a second. Let, let's, let's bring that forward a little bit, a little bit more. Lala is a character that I really enjoyed but I had mixed feelings. I found a lot of the humor around Udlala funny. I really liked his character, but at the same time, some of the humor I didn't find funny, and I actually found a little bit surprising, I guess I could say, because we had this whole dynamic with Udlala with, you know, all, all the dick jokes, all the sex jokes, and 
Um, the, the jokes themselves don't bother me, it's more of the context around them because Udlala isn't necessarily consenting in this situation. Like, there are scenes where, there's one scene in particular, but I'm thinking of where Udlala goes to, to Hull and Bug and says that he's pretty upset about this situation. He's not happy, he's feeling used, he's feeling, um, he's feeling like he's not being valued as an individual and he's just, he's being used. That's the right, that's the right wording for it. And he expresses this and Tahal just kind of laughs at him and he's like, no, Udlala, you're living the dream. This is every man's fantasy. You're getting endless amounts of sex. You're fine. You like it. And it, it read a little bit weird to me and I think, I think partially because it was coupled, partially because it was humorous. Like, it's all written with a tone of humor. But then you also have the situation with, and now I'm bouncing around and I'm sorry for that, but I kind of want to talk about this. I want to just take a second to talk about this with you because I don't really fully understand how I feel about it and I'd like to, I'd like to flesh it out and then hear what you think. Um, but you also have the situation with, um, Udenas, who his situation in this book is devastating, which by the way, I love Udenas, incredible character, but his situation too is devastating. I appreciate that Erickson doesn't just lean into sexual assaults against women uh, in his stories because that is very commonly the way it goes with fantasy and very commonly sexual assault is treated as just kind of dressing in a dark world. Like, look how dark this world is. Look at how grim dark I am. Look at all this that's happening to all the ladies that come on the page. And Erickson doesn't do that. He doesn't really do anything in a cavalier manner, but especially this. In each of these books, this stuff has been present, but it's also always been deeply explored. The consequences of it, the lasting impact of it, the incredible weight that this sort of thing carries. And I usually don't talk about it a lot in my reviews because this is something that I'm pretty sensitive about and I don't really like to just sit here and dwell on it for a really long time. But I do want to talk about it in this context because in the instance of Udenas, um, I just don't know how I feel because I almost felt distanced from the impact of what happened to Udenas and I can't tell if it's because he wasn't sure, he wasn't positive until the end, if this had even really happened to him because it happened in a dream and Feather Witch was, Feather Witch, yeah that's her name, was gaslighting him, trying to convince him that it didn't happen. But everything that happened to him and all the consequences of it to include his son and the revelation that he has this son that he didn't consent to the whole situation that happened around it. For some reason with Udenas, if I felt more distanced from the pain that and long-lasting um, damage that was done to him than I ever have with when Erickson explores this, than I ever have when Erickson explores this with women. And the same, and that ties me back to Udlala, who his situation is kind of played off for gags, and Tehol also is like, no, you're fine. And I can't tell if I'm reading this right. I can't tell if it's because, um, you know, just consent was treated differently, you know, years and years ago, especially consent of men was treated differently years and years ago. Uh, the idea of a man being raped or being assaulted or not consenting fully was oftentimes treated exactly how Tehol treated Udlala in this situation where it's like, no, guys like it, you're fine, you're fine. So I don't know if Erickson was making commentary on that and I'm just too sensitive to the topic to have really been able to read it correctly. Or if it's all an instance of something that has been, this has been presented to us but it hasn't been explored yet and he's gonna dig more into Udenas's pain and trauma and the impact in a later book. I don't know. I think I've talked about this long enough. You let me know what you think. Anyway, I want to make sure to spend a little bit of time on the end of the book before I finish up the video because this is probably, I think this is, this is my favorite ending so far of a Malazan book. Um, I, I don't even, I don't even know where, I don't even know where to start talking about this. There was so much tragedy in the end of this book uh, with the poison, 
with Rulad and everything that happened to him, him writhing on the floor, screaming for his brothers to help him, fear, um, abandoning Hull, Hull, Hull running toward his brother who was being beaten and being killed because he didn't have forgiveness. Just around every corner, everything that could have possibly, everything that could have possibly gone right went wrong. I mean, truly, it was a devastating, devastating end. It was, it was horrifying <laughs> from a character reader perspective, just I was gutted with what our characters went through at the end of this story. And I also am just very impressed with how Erickson, again, again, this story just feels so much more focused. And I don't know if it's me because I'm just getting better at reading Malazan or if it's Erickson or a combination of both, but this book just felt so much more focused and intentional and they all feel, they're all great. I'm not insulting other books. Um, but it feels so much more focused and intentional than I, th I, get, I guess I'll say, than I've noticed in other books. Like the big battle that went on and how this battle between the, uh, the, the Lethary and the Tistador and how they, it, how, br how brutal and horrifying it was and the technology that was brought forth, this warfare that happened and how it wasn't like this glorious fight, it was this tragic, somber, um, devastating battle, just kind of showcasing all that's lost, showcasing all the tragedy. It's just, it was such a tragedy. This battle was such a tragedy, and what happened in the throne room was such a tragedy and it just mirrored the the greater scale things that were happening between these people groups mirrored the smaller scale what was happening with these brothers and it was just devastating i mean devastating to read the betrayal the suffering the loss um was I mean, I always leave a Malazan book feeling really, really heavy and feeling like I've just gone through something. And there are certain aspects of Midnight Tides that don't feel nearly as heavy as certain scenes in other books. But at the same time, I walk away from this one just feeling like I've had almost like a bigger punch. I don't know. I can't describe it. It was just really, it was just so tragic. <laughs> it was just so tragic. But on top of that, we got so many other things that I haven't even mentioned in this video. So many other themes that were dis that were explored, like the taking of memories and um, the the fact that history is not always the truth that history changes depending on who you ask. Um, what's recorded is very rarely the most honest truth. That war isn't straightforward and that there's rarely just one side to root for 100% and sometimes you just don't even know who to root for. The evolution of time and technology and how that changes cultures and people, religions, societies. Just so many things. Just so many things were happening within this book and it all felt like it kind of intertwined together and it was kind of, to me, the perfect marriage of a wide scale and small scale story. It was just so good. Anyway, that is my non-cohesive review of a very cohesive book. Please feel free to chat with me more uh, about this book. There's a lot of things that I didn't talk about because just so much happens. It feels impossible every time I talk about these books, but there's also a lot of things that I kind of dug into a little bit that I'd really love your perspective. I'd really love alter al alternate perspectives on some of the stuff that I talked about here. Thanks again for being patient with me because it did take me a while to get the review for this one up, but I will be starting book six within a month from now. Um, I am so grateful <laughs> for my experience with this book. It was such a horrifying but positive 
fantastic experience and I definitely don't want to leave the gap between five and six very long. I always need a break between these books because there's just a lot. They take a lot out of me, not because they're very vast and because I don't understand everything and because it takes a lot of brain power, just emotionally they take a lot out of me. So I always have to have some distance before I can start the next one, uh, but I am going to start within a month from now because I loved this book so much and I don't want a long break this time. I'm just not interested in one. So anyway, thank you for joining me in my journey through Malazan. Thanks for being patient with me because I am not smart enough for these books and I miss things, I misunderstand things, and I mix stuff up. So feel free to correct me on any of the stuff that I mixed up or misunderstood. Happy to have that always. I post videos every Tuesday and Thursday on this channel, Mondays and Fridays on my other channel, which is always linked in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye.